On the 8th of September 2022, the course of history took a new turn. As the sun set on Queen Elizabeth II's historic reign, the world looked on as a nation and a family embarked on a new era, the centre of which is one man. He was Prince Charles for all of his 73 years, until, on that rainy autumn day, he became king. After seven decades, this chapter was all he had been waiting for, but was it all that he expected? The year that followed was his chance to carve out his identity and his place in history. It was a year of mourning, political turbulence, family feuds, and a war in Europe. But it was also a year of celebration, friendship, cooperation, and a look towards how the role of monarchy would evolve in the 21st century. Here, we take a look back on King Charles III's defining year, what it meant for him, what it meant for Britain, what it meant for the world, and what it tells us about the future of his reign and the kind of king he is destined to be. Let's start at the beginning. It's Thursday the 8th of September, 2022. In London, Britain's new Prime Minister is not yet a week into her premiership, and top of her agenda is to tackle the UK's energy crisis. In Windsor, it's the first day of term for the royal children, George, Charlotte and Louis, attending Lambrook School for the first time since their parents, William and Kate, moved the family out of the capital. In the Scottish Highlands, the Queen, the then Prince Charles, Camilla and Princess Anne are holidaying on the Balmoral estate. To the outside world, it was business as usual. But at 12.32pm, it emerged that all was not well. Buckingham Palace issued a statement to say doctors were concerned for the Queen's health and that Her Majesty was under medical supervision. By 4pm, senior members of the royal family, Prince William, Prince Edward, Sophie, Countess of Wessex, and Prince Andrew were flying to Aberdeen, and an hour later, they arrived at Balmoral. Then, at precisely 6.30 p.m. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. And we are interrupting regular programming to bring you breaking news. It is with deep sadness that Buckingham Palace has announced Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in Commonwealth history, has died at the age of 96. It is with great sadness that we interrupt our programme to tell you that Queen Elizabeth II has passed away. The Queen has died. It's the day we knew was inevitable, but had hoped would never come. And so the reign of Elizabeth II comes to a close after 70 years, at the age of 96, her son Charles is now king. The transition was seamless. The reign of King Charles III began at the moment of his mother's last breath. We first heard from the king shortly after the news broke. In a written statement, the sense of grief was palpable. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family, he wrote. Continuing, we mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. The deep personal loss was evident, but with it, the profound sense of duty held so dearly by his late mother also emerged, and after one night of reprieve, the King's work began in earnest. Together with his Queen consort, Charles III returned to London the following day. In the first of many firsts, His Majesty met his people outside Buckingham Palace visibly moved by the crowd that had gathered to pay their respects to the past and usher in the future. He beard like a king today. He didn't just go straight in, he came to see, see the people. See the people. No. Yeah, I feel a bit sorry for him. I bet deep down he's really sad, but I think it's nice of him to come and meet the crowd. I 
think he'll do a good job and she'll be proud of it. It's really inspirational, <laughs> I think, having lost his mum to come here and just be really, like, stable. I think it's a time of change. He's ready to embrace new ideas. He's more willing to be a bit more open, I think. I think we're going to see a little bit of change from the monarchy now. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. The Buckingham Palace walkabout set the tone for the 12 days of mourning that followed. Though grappling with personal grief, the king never kept behind palace doors for too long. In leading the official mourning period, His Majesty undertook a gruelling schedule of meetings, visits and ceremonial duties. He toured all four corners of the nation as his late mother's coffin made its way from Edinburgh to London, where it lay in state in Westminster Hall. The king and his siblings stood vigil beside the coffin as members of the public filed past to pay their last respects. And then, like in so many aspects of this ancient family, the next generation followed in their example. The queen's last journey continued to Westminster Abbey for her state funeral and subsequently to her final resting place in Windsor. The king was there every step of the way. Becoming king was the culmination of a long personal journey for Charles, but it also marked a much anticipated transition in public life. Queen Elizabeth II was widely considered one of the best acquainted world leaders of all time. During her 70 year reign, she hosted more than 100 state visits, carried out countless tours all over the world, met with 13 US presidents and oversaw 15 prime ministers at home. Over the last year, Charles has begun to scratch the surface of this impressive headcount, though he may not have expected to get off to such a rapid start when it came to Westminster. If the Queen had been a symbol of stability, it was perhaps apt that around the time of her death, British politics fell into a period of unprecedented turbulence. Liz Truss was the 15th and final Prime Minister to form a government in Her Late Majesty's name, having met with the monarch at Balmoral just two days before her death. Not long after, the King held an audience with his first PM, and could his comments have foreshadowed what was to come for the ill-fated Truss administration? Dear, oh dear indeed. Alongside her Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, the Prime Minister's brash economic policies sent the markets into freefall. I am a fighter and not a quitter. She was ousted after just 44 days in office. Thank you. Barely a month after first meeting the King, she returned to the palace, as is custom, to hand in her resignation. And next through the revolving political door was her successor, Rishi Sunak. Two Prime Ministers in two months for the King. But whatever the goings on at home, as head of state, the British monarch remains a fundamentally global figure, and King Charles is no stranger to the world stage. Some 500 world leaders attended the state funeral of Queen Elizabeth II, and around 100 returned to the UK for Charles' coronation. In the days leading up to both events, His Majesty personally received various leaders from the Commonwealth and beyond. He hosted his first state visit when the red carpet was rolled out for the South African president, Cyril Ramaphosa, at Buckingham Palace in November. And in July 2023, US President Joe Biden, who had been represented at the coronation by his wife Jill and granddaughter Finnegan, was welcomed to Windsor Castle with a royal salute and guard of honour. In March 2023, Charles and Camilla carried out their first official visit overseas as King and Queen, a three-day trip to Germany that was seen as largely successful. His Majesty won hearts by twice showing off his German language skills and poking fun at the testy Anglo-German football rivalry. Football. 
Though the royal visit to Germany was a predominantly jolly affair, the king remained sensitive to the bleaker picture across the European landscape. Russia was 196 days into its invasion of Ukraine when Charles took the throne. And now, a year on, the war is showing no sign of slowing down. As king, Charles must distance himself from politics and foreign policy, something that may not come naturally to him after a lifetime as Prince of Wales making his views known. But he has been able to be active in showing his personal support for the Ukrainian people. In October 2022, he met with refugees in Aberdeen, and the following month he officially opened a new Ukrainian welcome centre in London. As the war neared its one-year mark in February, His Majesty received Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky at Buckingham Palace. Well, we've all been worried about you and thinking about your country for so long, I can't tell you. And visited Ukrainian troops taking part in training exercises with British soldiers. So it's an amazing feeling to be in the presence of uh, His Majesty and uh, that it is unbelievable that we had this opportunity today. I am amazed by having the ability to meet uh, His Majesty the King today. His Majesty was asked how we were doing, how the training was going. He inquired as to our health. Uh, he inquired how the training was going to be used in, in further actions. But what particularly stood out for myself was that uh, he took a particular interest in the well-being of our families, of our, our wives, our children. But of course, it shows the support of both the nation and uh, the monarchy uh, towards something that's very, very important for all of us. On the anniversary of the invasion, the king paid tribute to the truly remarkable courage and resilience of the Ukrainian people in the face of the unnecessary suffering inflicted upon them. He added, I can only hope the outpouring of solidarity from across the globe may bring not only practical aid, but also strength from the knowledge that together we stand united. It's difficult to reflect on King Charles's first year on the throne without remarking on the ever-present legacy of his late mother. In many ways, Queen Elizabeth made sure to tie up all loose ends of her reign by the time it ended. She appeared on Buckingham Palace balcony for one last time as she attended her Platinum Jubilee celebrations in June 2022. She ensured her wishes were known for Camilla to assume the role of Queen Consort when the time came. And, as we've seen, she even saw in one last Prime Minister just days before she died. But in family life, there remained a great dilemma that proved unsolvable within the Queen's lifetime. He's called Harry. By the time Charles assumed the throne, the feud between his sons was well known and widely documented. Following their controversial withdrawal from royal life and move across the Atlantic, Harry and Meghan had launched several missiles over palace walls, claiming the firm had failed to protect them, made them victims of vicious competition between royal households, and fed them to the bloodthirsty media wolves. And there was more to come. The first blow was Harry and Meghan's Netflix documentary that landed on the streaming site in December. As far as a lot of the family were concerned, everything that she was being put through they had been put through as well. So it was almost like a rite of passage. And I said, the difference here is the race element. Then this family, sometimes, you know, you're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And there is a huge level of unconscious bias. In the face of these claims, the king opted for the age-old royal philosophy of never complain, never explain. The family carried on with business as usual, and despite being painted as cold and distant, were all smiles at the Christmas carol service hosted by the Princess of Wales. The palace did not comment on the documentary or the allegations made, but just a week later was forced to address another race route that erupted under its roof. Ngozi Falani, who was at the time chief executive of domestic abuse charity Sister Space, had attended a reception hosted by the Queen Consort at Buckingham Palace the month before. It was there that she met Lady Susan Hussey, a lady-in-waiting to the late Queen and godmother to Prince William. She demanded to know where I was from. No, really, where I was from. No, where I was really from. And no matter how many times I answered her, it wasn't the response she wanted. It can't be that you invite people from different demographics to attend a function about violence against women and girls and they are faced with non-physical violence. So that's what needs to be addressed. In an unusual move for the palace, the issue was addressed. 
Susan Hussey resigned, the palace apologised, and organised a meeting between the two women to resolve the row. Buckingham Palace then released a statement saying, at this meeting filled with warmth and understanding, Lady Susan offered her sincere apologies for the comments that were made and the distress they caused to Miss Fellani. Lady Susan has pledged to deepen her awareness of the sensitivities involved and is grateful for the opportunity to learn more about the issues in this area. Sadly, reports of such warmth and understanding have not appeared between the Sovereign and the Sussexes, with neither party seeming to engage in the same problem-solving spirit. It could perhaps have been due to Missile Number 2, Prince Harry's explosive memoir Spare and various television interviews surrounding its publication. In the ghost-written account, Harry alleged that William had physically attacked him, that the brothers had begged their father not to marry Camilla, and that his stepmother was embroiled in a dangerous deal with the British press to rehabilitate her public image at the expense of other royals. At the time of publication in January, there was, as ever, no royal response. In fact, contact between the family was minimal, and as preparations continued for the upcoming coronation, questions swirled as to whether the king's second son would even attend. Harry himself said relations would need to improve if he were to do so. There's a lot that can happen between now and then, but, you know, the door is always open, the, the ball is in their court. There's a lot to be discussed, and I really hope that they are willing to sit down and talk about it. It's unclear whether they did indeed sit down and talk about it, but come April, something did seem to have shifted. The palace released a statement which read, Buckingham Palace is pleased to confirm that the Duke of Sussex will attend the coronation service at Westminster Abbey on the 6th of May. The Duchess of Sussex will remain in California with Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet. It was by no means a sign of full reconciliation, the rift was still very much alive, and indeed the presence of Harry may have been cause for concern for those whose alleged misdemeanours he so publicly laid bare. Harry found himself sat two rows behind his brother during the service, and while the heir travelled back to the palace in the Diamond Jubilee State Coach, the spare made a swift exit by car. But for all of the fallout, Harry's presence was a move that kept the door, even just ever so slightly, open for possible future peacemaking and would no doubt have been of comfort to the king to have both his sons by his side for his life-defining date with destiny. The crowning glory of his first year on the throne and the defining moment of his lifetime, here is a closer look at that most special day. It was a day for the history books. Charles had already been king for eight months, but this was the moment he and the world had been waiting for. An ancient ceremony that has been held in Westminster Abbey for the last nine centuries, the crowning of a sovereign is a rich tapestry of military displays, religious significance and sacred oaths. The coronation of King Charles III was no different, but many aspects of this great state occasion were decidedly personal, offering an insight into the man behind the monarch and where he might be taking the crown. The king was crowned alongside his wife on Saturday the 6th of May 2023 in a dazzling spectacle of pomp, pageantry and people. 2,000 invited guests filled the abbey, thousands of spectators lined the streets outside and hundreds of millions tuned in around the world to watch this rare phenomenon. The day began with the arrival of more than 5,000 members of the armed forces who travelled by train to take part in the processions. By 7am, the Abbey doors were open and it was shortly jam-packed with the great and good of Britain and beyond. Those with the golden ticket included foreign royals, world leaders, political powerhouses, greats of the stage and screen, religious representatives and charity champions. The King and Queen made their way to the ceremony in the Diamond Jubilee State Coach, accompanied by a splendid household cavalry march. The impressive military procession lasted 1.42 miles, and at the end of it, Charles emerged as we had never seen him before. Clad in opulent coronation robes, their majesties processed through the abbey. We saw Prince George carry out his ceremonial duty of page of honour to his grandfather, and the Queen was also attended by her grandchildren.
The air of antiquity was potent as the traditional vivat acclamations reverberated around the ancient walls, the Latin words translating to long live Queen Camilla and long live King Charles. Throughout, deference was met with humility. As children of the kingdom of God, we welcome you in the name of the King of Kings. In his name and after his example, I come not to be served, but to serve. And solemn promises brought to light the deep sense of duty and service. Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland your other realms and the territories to any of them belonging or pertaining, according to their respective laws and customs. I solemnly promise so to do. And then the most sacred part, hidden from view, Charles, divested of his robes, was anointed with holy oil by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Behind the screen, a moment of quiet between King and God. <laughs> Next, the king took to the 700-year-old coronation chair upon the ancient stone of destiny, where he was presented with orb, scepter, and then crown. St. Edward's crown was placed on his head, the one and only time he'll wear it in his lifetime. Life and limb. Prince William paid so homage to his father, the king, pledging his loyalty with a kiss on the cheek, as members of the congregation and public were invited to also swear their allegiance. And for the first time since 1937, a queen consort was crowned too, something Camilla must have once thought an impossibility. God Save the King rang out, and His Majesty wore the magnificent imperial state crown as he and his queen stepped out of the abbey and into their new life. The afternoon continued much in the same celebratory vein. The Gold State coach sailed back to Buckingham Palace among a sea of soldiers in the biggest military show since 1953. The rain couldn't dampen the spirits of the jubilant onlookers, thrilled to catch a glimpse of the King, or even better, mischievous Prince Louis up to his usual tricks. A royal salute from his armed forces. Three cheers for His Majesty the King and Her Majesty the Queen! Hip, hip. <laughs> A fly pass from the Red Arrows and an outpouring from the thousands who braved the British weather to witness this moment of history. In July, the coronation was officially celebrated in Scotland with a service of thanksgiving at St Giles's Cathedral, complete with procession and fly past. But this celebration, Coronation Day itself, and several other days in the King's short reign were not solely displays of undiluted adulation. While many who have been present at a royal event or engagement have reveled in the pomp and pageantry, others have seized the opportunity to voice their opposition to the King and what he stands for. Banners and chants of Not My King have been frequent accessories to royal events over the past year. But one anti-royal protester chose to take a more extreme course of action. Patrick Thelwell, a 23-year-old university student, threw not one, not two, but four eggs at the King during a visit to York. The monarch attempted to ignore the onslaught while his security team sprung to action and the visit, which was to unveil a statue of the late Queen at York Minster, went ahead unaffected. Thelwell, who was swiftly arrested, told police the King deserved the egging, describing it as the only justice the victims of colonialism will ever get. He was subsequently found guilty of threatening behaviour and handed a 12-month community order with 100 hours of unpaid work. After his day in court, Thelwell stood by his actions. 
I think the judge uh, focused on the specifics of the case, which is like, did I throw an egg or not? And I never denied that I did. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I also didn't apologize for it. In the months since the Eggy escapade, it appears the country isn't quite ready for any major change just yet. Polling by YouGov suggests 62% of Brits believe the UK should continue having a monarchy, compared to 26% with the opposite view, largely on par with opinion polls over the last 10 years. So, while the fate of a monarchy is never certain, there doesn't seem to be an immediate threat to its existence on these shores. But as the reign of King Charles III reaches its first anniversary, what has it told us about the new Carolean era? To an extent, an old adage springs to mind. The more things change, the more they stay the same. The death of Queen Elizabeth II and the accession of King Charles III epitomized Britain's ability to keep calm and carry on. In the face of losing a constitutional titan, the country was driven by the slow march of rituals carried out centuries over. A prince became king as night follows day. But not quite everything has stayed the same. Beyond his palace walls, this king reigns over a changed world. And that handover of power made space for different visions for Britain to emerge. The age of deference and mystique is all but gone, replaced with demands for scrutiny and transparency at home and serious questions overseas about the monarchy's place in the realms and commonwealth. Charles appears at least open to this new order, going so far as to support a study into his family's links with slavery. And perhaps he has no choice. The late Queen's ability to modernise just enough while remaining a cultural constant, proved integral to the success of her time on the throne and the preservation of her family's institution. Now, a year into his reign, her son, King Charles III, has embarked on that delicate tightrope walk. And with the eyes of history upon him, the future of the monarchy will depend on every step. Good evening. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. Her reign lasted for 70 years, from post-war austerity and the end of empire through the expansion of the Commonwealth. The Queen died the... peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. Thursday, 8th of September 2022, 6.30pm. The, the news that everyone knew would come, and yet no one was really prepared for. The death of the only monarch most Britons ever knew brought to an end a reign which had lasted 70 years and 214 days, the longest in British history. Steadfast in her service to country and commonwealth, a constant in British post-war public life, the outpouring of grief which greeted her death was powerful and personal. Four out of five of the UK's population weren't even alive when she ascended the throne. I remember I met the Queen in, uh, was it 2012? She came to St Mark's Secondary School. Yeah, so uh, she's been there my whole life. It's quite a significant death, quite impacted me and my family, yeah. We're so grateful for what she's done and for what she sought this country through after the war. And, um, well, the weather is fitting, right? <laughs> um, so it's... Um, it's not surprising, but at the same time, it's, um, it's a big thing. It's devastating. Quite broken up, to be honest. I was in the uh, military for 12 years, so she's a boss. That awesome Thursday afternoon began with a discouraging press release from Buckingham Palace, the Queen's doctors expressing their concern for her health. The soon-to-be King and Queen consort were already at Balmoral, Elizabeth II's other children hastily made their way to Aberdeenshire. By the evening, notices of the Queen's death were posted outside Buckingham Palace in London and the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. The Union flag and the Royal Banner of Scotland were lowered to half-mast. The first of thousands of flowers were laid. People gathered outside the royal residences, unperturbed by the heavy September rain. 
and black-clad political leaders pay tribute. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. Above the clashes of politics, she stood not for what the nation fought over, but what it agreed upon. In crisis, she reassured us, reminding us that we are all part of something that stretches back through time, a symbol of the best of us. Scotland loved, respected and admired her. And by all accounts, Her Majesty was really happier than when she was here in Scotland at her beloved Balmoral. As dawn broke the following day, king and country began adjusting to a world without their matriarch. The moment I've been dreading, mm. as, as I know a lot of people have, but mm. Mm. try and keep everything going. Absolutely. Come, come, come. Thank you. Charles's interactions with the crowd outside Buckingham Palace marked an immediate change from that of his predecessor, less formal, more tactile. Whilst he performed his functions as a king, there was sympathy for Charles the man, the son. It was amazing to see his emotion there that he's feeling. He's, he's got a hard job in front of him, but he's had a fantastic mentor, so um, I wish him well. And it was, it was nice to hear the God Save the King and Hippie and all of those. So, so I wish him well, and hopefully he does us all proud, and I'm sure he will do. 96 guns rang out from Edinburgh down to Gibraltar one for every year of the Queen's extraordinary life. The Queen's favourite sport, horse racing, paused for two days as a mark of respect. Queen Elizabeth saw 15 Prime Ministers during her remarkable order, reign. Order. The latter three of those led tributes in the Commons. She saw off her 14th Prime Minister, and I can tell you, in that audience, she was as radiant and as knowledgeable and as fascinated by politics as ever I can remember. I had a split-second decision to make. <laughs> I picked up the cheese, put it on the plate and put it on the table. <laughs> and I turned round to see that my every move <laughs> had been watched very carefully by Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> I looked at her, she looked at me. <laughs> And she just smiled. <laughs> there came the formalities of proclaiming the new monarch. Centuries old and not seen for 70 years. The Accession Council, made up of the monarch's key advisers, meets after the death of a sovereign to proclaim their successor at St James's Palace. The wording of Charles III's proclamation was largely unchanged since those of Charles I and Charles II nearly 400 years ago. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. God save the King! Readings of the proclamation came from all four corners of the United Kingdom, the tradition of an era before mass media performed for the first time on television. Beseeching God by whom kings and queens do reign, to bless his majesty with long and happy years to reign over us. Trodwyd am Hallas St. James, a degved deed already, a mluid ein hargluid dwy fil a dwy ar hygain. And whilst traditional habits were on display, old habits die hard. To bless her majesty, his majesty, with long and happy years to reign over us. Her late majesty began the first leg of her final journey, travelling from her beloved Balmoral to her Edinburgh residence, the palace of Holyrood House. Sweet pea flowers topped her coffin, hand-picked from Balmoral. They were the Queen's favourites. Impromptu guards of honour were formed by the side of the road as she passed. Tractors, horses. She was a country woman at heart. 
Elizabeth's late husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, once joked he was the world's most experienced plaque unveiler. The Queen's final journey to the Scottish capital took her across the spectacular Queensferry Crossing, a bridge she had opened alongside Prince Philip just five years previously. Following behind the hearse on the journey south was the Queen's daughter, the Princess Royal. The ability to have somebody who is kind of epitomises what you think your country stands for has always been a, uh, a major uh, ambition. And it's a huge advantage if you have somebody who is, can be recognised as that, uh, not just in your country, but uh, around the world. At Holyrood House, the King performed the traditions that his mother had done so often before. As she reposed just metres away inside the palace, Charles inspected the Guard of Honour and received the keys to the city of Edinburgh for the first time as sovereign. The Queen was then carried along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, where she would lie in state for 24 hours. This time her hearse was followed by all four of her children, who kept vigil inside the cathedral. Outside, a queue began to form to see the late monarch, a taster of what was to come in London just two days later. Tuesday, and as the Queen moved south to London, the new King visited Northern Ireland. Elizabeth and Charles had an unquestioned affection for the island of Ireland, although their visits were politically and emotionally charged affairs. Their affection was and is reciprocated by many, Whilst for others north of the border, the British monarch is the symbol of a union they do not wish to be a part of. There was warmth, however, between King Charles and Michelle O'Neill, Vice President of the Irish Republican and Nationalist Party Sinn Féin. Thank you so much for all the incredibly kind things that you said about my mother. Well, she played a great role here in terms of reconciliation and building my peace, so it's the end of an era for sure. On a rain-soaked evening back in London, Crowds lined the streets to watch the moving sight of the Queen's last ever return to Buckingham Palace. The next day, the Queen left the palace for the last time and was taken to Westminster Hall. At nearly 1,000 years old, it is the oldest existing part of the Palace of Westminster. It was there that she would lie in state until the day of her funeral, just as her mother, father, grandfather and great-grandfather had also done. In true British fashion, people queued and queued and stayed up through the night to see the UK's matriarch of 70 years just one last time. It was lovingly dubbed the Elizabeth Line after the underground railway named in her honour. A wait of 24 hours would normally test anyone's resolve. Instead, as people from across the world filed past iconic London sites as far back as Tower Bridge, the queue became an example of humanity at its finest. You look like a man who like a mint. Yeah. Give me a few. There you go. Here for a purpose, which is coming together with other people in a like-minded nature, just to pay their respects. And everybody's been well, very well behaved and eating my mints, more importantly. There's six of us. Yeah, no, and we're all close bond now, aren't we? We exchange phone numbers. <laughs> New WhatsApp group and everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Footballing royalty joined the queue. David Beckham waited 12 hours to reach Westminster Hall. I thought by coming at 2 a.m. it was going to be a little bit quieter. I was wrong. Everybody had that in mind. Um, but the people here, you know, all ages, you know, there was a, like I said, an 84 year old lady walking around, there was a 90 year old gentleman walking around. Everybody wants to be here to be part of this experience and celebrate what Her Majesty has done for us. The Archbishop of Canterbury, leader of the Church of England, was among the many volunteers who donned a high vis jacket and offered support to the committed cures. On the final day, anyone's leftover food was donated to those in need. If you've got any non-perishable sealed food and drink, we are collecting for the Felix Project Food Bank. Formerly the Prince of Wales, Charles paid his first visit to Cardiff as king. A service to remember Her Late Majesty.
Dear friends, we have come together this morning to give thanks to God for the life of Queen Elizabeth II. And then to Wales's legislative chamber, the Senedd, where he addressed members in Welsh and English. Dioch o galon ichi am ich geriai caredig. I am deeply grateful for the addresses of condolence, which so movingly paid tribute to our late sovereign, my beloved mother, the Queen. Anti-monarchy protests were perhaps more evident here than any other part of the country. The title of the Prince of Wales is given to English-born and raised heirs to the throne and is seen by some as a symbol of Welsh subjugation. Wales was close to the Queen's heart, nowhere more so than the village of Abelvan, devastated by a coal tip spill which killed 116 children, most under the age of 10. Elizabeth was deeply moved by her first visit to the bereaved community and she returned to the village many times. In the days after her death, people remembered the Queen's delicate yet powerful responses in moments of national tragedy. The presence and words of the head of state providing strength when people felt weak. I want to express my admiration for the people of our capital city who in the aftermath of yesterday's bombings are calmly determined to resume their normal lives. That is the answer to this outrage. She was extraordinary in these disasters and trauma, traumatic occasions. It was again all very quiet and it was almost as if she was there as a mother and a parent, you know, and a grandparent to sympathise with people who'd lost or suffered. Um, nothing contrived about it at all. And she always trod that fine line between showing breaking down, which must have been quite hard not to do in certain circumstances, and showing maximum sympathy and empathy. Um, and I have to say, I think most people feel this, that if you woke up in bed one day and you were involved in a, an accident, you'd want to see her rather than certain prime ministers, one could think of. All prime ministers, actually. She's the one person who perhaps you would want from outside. And that's a great tribute to her, really. And I think most people felt that. And she did it with um, understated grace and sympathy, always, without fail. And then I remember she asked, um, was I there on the night? Where was I? Yeah, I live right in front of it. We were evacuated about one o'clock. The flames were just... Even though I was in shock, I still felt comfortable. I felt happy to talk to her. It was still this sadness, but this, this, this feeling of we're not alone. The Queen has always been there. And she's not only always been there, she's always been herself. She's been consistent. She made a promise when she was 21 that she would serve her country and the Commonwealth for as long as she lived. And she delivered on that promise. On the fourth day of Her Late Majesty's lying in state, the Queen's grandchildren stood vigil by her coffin. Solemn, ordered, a rare glimpse of all eight grandchildren coming together, mourning alongside members of the public who shared their love for the Queen. Elizabeth's affection for her grandchildren was always evident, as at Prince Harry's christening, talking to Peter and Zara about their new puppy. It's called Dash. Dash. And you know it's the word you use when you're cross. Dash. It comes out frightfully well as a dog's name, see. The queue outside Westminster Hall wasn't getting any shorter. And the King and Prince of Wales came to Lambeth Bridge on Saturday to show their appreciation to those who patiently waited. As the funeral approached, full overnight dress rehearsals took place with military precision. Overseas, heads of state and dignitaries began to arrive and share their own memories of Britain's longest reigning monarch. As Prime Minister, I benefited from her counsel, her thoughtfulness, her curiosity, her sense of humour, uh, and the engagement that showed a deep, deep and abiding interest in and love for Canadians. She asked, uh, questions in a level of detail that showed me she was keeping a very, a very close eye on affairs. 
Um, but at the same time, she was also a mum and she was a grandmum. And so I asked her a few, I just asked her um, a little bit about life and including during lockdown. And she was always very forthcoming. The fact that during COVID, we spoke twice. You know, she's just checking in, seeing that we were doing okay. It, it really did feel like someone was looking out for you. The Queen's predecessors reigned over a Britain whose empire was expanding. In the early years of her reign, Elizabeth oversaw an imperial shrinking and the emergence of the Commonwealth of Nations. At the time of her death, the Queen was sovereign of 14 countries besides the UK. Those nations marked the passing of a Queen who saw many of them become independent states, but some also spoke of a future without the British monarchy. Uh, my job as Prime Minister of Australia is to represent uh, Australia at this historic time. And I believe you can have uh, different views, as Australians do, a range of views over our constitutional system, uh, but uh, be united in respect for uh, the life of service that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth showed to Australia, to the Commonwealth, and indeed to the world. It's nothing personal. It's not about Queen Elizabeth or King Charles. It is getting a head of state who is Jamaican as a symbol to our country that we have accepted the full reins of sovereignty and sworn to protect the Jamaican people and the Jamaican people only. At 8pm on the eve of the Queen's funeral, the United Kingdom fell silent. But among the tears and the sadness of this week of mourning, the Archbishop of Canterbury revealed something of the Queen's humour and calmness in the face of death. After she opened the General Synod of the Parliament of the Church of England in 2015, and she gave a speech, and everyone cheered and shouted, God save the Queen! Long live the Queen! And we were going down the corridor back to her car after this, and she said, Do you know, Archbishop, I think I've lived long enough, don't you? And, and I said, well, ma'am, I, I think that I'm either going to sound obsequious or um, treasonous, whichever answer I give to that. So we had a little laugh about that and on we went. But, you know, it was just a quip, but it was her humour, but also her realism. She didn't fear what was coming. And that came out of her faith. Justin Welby would deliver the sermon at the Queen's funeral in a Christian service. Although Supreme Governor of the Church of England, the Queen respected people of all faiths and none, an admiration which was reciprocated. We're all mourning, irrespective of your religion, your faith, your race. We are all the same. I don't mind being here in the Gurdwara celebrating the remembrance of the Queen. My faith has taught me to love everybody. When you look at Her Majesty's reign, you see that her service, despite being rooted in her own faith, actually acknowledged and accepted diversity um, and, and that was appreciated by those who came here. Monday the 19th of September, the day of the funeral, but before the sun broke, the last member of the public paid their respects. Some 250,000 people had made this pilgrimage, forming friendships and sparking romances, all in the space of four and a half days. Blackrod, the ceremonial officer of the House of Lords, formally closed the lying in state. The end of the Elizabeth line.
few leaders receive the outpouring of love that we have seen. The grief of this day, felt not only by the late Queen's family, but all round the nation, the Commonwealth and the world, arises from her abundant life and loving service, now gone from us. Service in life, hope in death. All who follow the Queen's example and inspiration of trust and faith in God can with her say, we will meet again.
come together to commit into the hands of God the soul of his servant, Queen Elizabeth. Here in St. George's Chapel, where she so often worshipped, we are bound to call to mind someone whose uncomplicated yet profound Christian faith bore so much fruit. Like as a father pitieth his own children, even so is the Lord merciful unto them that fear him. For he knoweth whereof we are made, he remembereth that we are but dust. The days of man are but as grass, for he flourisheth as a flower of the field. For as soon as the wind goeth over it, it is gone and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endureth for ever and ever upon them that fear him, and his righteousness upon children's children. Go forth upon thy journey from this world, O Christian soul, in the name of God the Father Almighty, who created thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, who suffered for thee. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who strengtheneth thee. In communion with the blessed saints, and aided by angels and archangels, and all the armies of the heavenly host, may thy portion this day be in peace, and thy dwelling in the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. Amen.